Hello class, welcome to the next installment, Hestia, Hera, and Hephaestus, Zeus's rise to power, which as we'll see is all about Zeus and his many goddesses. The textbook begins its chapter on the 12 or 14 Olympians, quite interestingly with a quote from Aristotle's Magna Moralia, specifically about whether the gods are our friends or not. Some think a friendship towards the gods and towards inanimate things exist, but they are wrong. We believe that friendship exists where there is reciprocity of friendly affection, but friendship towards God does not admit of such reciprocity, not even of a one-sided friendship on our part, for it would be absurd if someone were to say that he had a friendly love towards Zeus. This is an interesting corrective with which to begin the study of the Olympian pantheon, since if you ask the average person or student who is their favorite Greek god, they'll very likely tell you that it's so-and-so Olympian. When you ask them why, they'll say, I feel like I can relate to that one best. This way of thinking about the Olympian gods effaces their divine otherness. Indeed, their very character as gods. And so this quote from Aristotle is a helpful thing to keep in mind as we begin to investigate the Olympians as gods. In the wake of the Titanomachy and Hesiod's Theogony, we first hear about the three male Olympians, Zeus, Poseidon, and Hades. And it doesn't seem that the plot of Percy Jackson and the Lightning Thief got very far beyond this single line from Hesiod. In the Iliad, we hear that the three gods cast lots regarding which domain would be theirs. And of course, Hades got the short end of the stick. This is kind of a silly myth, because of course it was a foregone conclusion from the very structure of the myth that Zeus would rule the sky or Olympus. Poseidon the sea, naturally leaving no other job for Hades or Aedes than being the king of the underworld. Jumping a fair bit ahead in Hesiod's narrative, the textbook next says that Zeus takes Hera, his sister, as his wife, but that her sisters Hestia and Demeter also share in the feminine divine powers and functions. As we'll see, many major gods and goddesses are given their prerogative, either just after the Titanomachy or just after the Gigantomachy, more on that later. And so we arrive finally in week four of the course to the 12 or the 14 Olympians. In fact, there are 14 Olympians and the later canonical number of 12 is arrived at by omitting Hades and replacing Hestia with Dionysus. I'm sure Hades and Hestia were none too pleased with this move. At bottom, the whole idea of 12 Olympians is suspect. There have always been 14 most important rulers in the Olympian pantheon. And here you see them arranged with their Roman names. And yes, you should probably learn the Roman names as well moving forward in this course. For the next many weeks of this course, we'll be approaching each of the 12 Olympians systematically, usually in a separate lecture or unit. Although to understand the unity of the Pantheon and the process of its creation in Greek mythology, I'll be covering here the earliest Olympian, Hestia, as well as the last two, Zeus and Hera. We'll also be looking into Hephaestus, Hera's son. The rest of these Olympians will come up, but we'll save a more in-depth discussion of them for the future. So let's begin with the very often undertreated goddess Hestia, the goddess of the hearth. As we hear in Theogony 454, Hestia, the firstborn daughter of Kronos and Rhea. Hestia was both the first to be conceived and the first to be born or vomited up by Kronos. There are two Homeric hymns to Hestia which give us precious information about this often undertreated goddess in myth. In one of them, the poet sings Hestia in the lofty dwellings of all both of immortal gods and of the men who walk the earth, you have attained an eternal abode and highest honor, together with a fair and honorific prize. For without you, there can be no feasts for mortals, if at the beginning, yours is not the first and the last libation of honey-sweet wine. These last lines are very interesting indeed. No ritual feast or divine ceremonial can be performed without propitiating Hestia both first and last. And we even hear about the correct way to do this in any Greek ceremonial. That is through a libation of wine or spendi to Hestia. As Jean-Joseph Gou notes, Hesiod, Sophocles, Aristophanes, Euripides, and Plato are all unanimous in indicating that every meal and every ritual should begin with a prayer and a sacrifice to Hestia. Most commonly represented as a goddess of chastity, she rejects the advances of Poseidon and Apollo, as we hear in the Homeric hymn to Aphrodite, and vows to forever remain a virgin. And Zeus, in his epithet of Zeus Hestios, is important in granting her this request. Among the three original Olympian goddesses, Demeter, Hestia, and Hera, Hestia thus becomes the only one that Zeus doesn't sleep with. Her name means literally hearth, and she is associated with the sacred fire of the hearth. 
And importantly, this can take two basic forms, the hearth of the family or the hearth of the tribe and the polis. That is the personal hearth and the political hearth. Indeed, transmission of the sacred fire from one hearth to another, whether from one family hearth to another family hearth or one tribal hearth to another, represents a bond of affection and kinship. This is the origin of the practice, still ongoing every four years in the Olympics, of transferring the flame. In this way, our modern customs continue to worship Hestia, without, however, giving her a name. The hearth fire, Hestia, in the Greek way of thinking, is holy, and the goddess herself is present in the fire. In the other Homeric hymn to Hestia, we hear, Hestia, you who tend the haloed house of the far shooter Apollo in holy Pytho, liquid oil always drips from your hair. Come to this house, enter in sympathetic support, along with Zeus, the wise counselor. Grant as well a pleasing grace to my song. Now here's the really weird thing about Hestia. Although doubtless one of the most ubiquitous goddesses in the daily life of the Greeks, and the most frequently worshipped in every feast or festival, each one beginning and ending with Hestia, Hestia is at the same time, and other than Ares, the god of war, the least represented of all the Olympian gods, both in myth and art. In his masterful article, Vesta, or the Place of Being, Jean-Joseph Gou attempts to explain this. Quote, the gods of Greece and Rome are the objects of innumerable representations, both pictorial and sculptural. The Greeks, unlike some of their neighbors, were a very iconophilic rather than an iconophobic people. But this iconophilia appears strictly to not apply to Hestia. The very weird thing about Hestia or Vesta is that she is unrepresentable. Among all the deities whose deeds are celebrated in myth and whose representations form the subject matter of sculpture and painting, the goddess Hestia or Roman Vesta is distinguished by a remarkable lack of history and an equally remarkable absence or poverty of images. The poet Ovid himself notes this about Hestia, singing, Long did I foolishly think that there were images of Vesta. Afterwards I learned that there are none under the curved dome. An undying fire is hidden in that temple, but there is no effigy of Vesta nor of fire. In Ovid's account, there is neither simulacra nor effigies of Hestia, nothing but a perpetual fire that occupies the central, circular enclosure of her temple. Gu goes on, neither the Greeks nor the Romans put any limit on the cult of images. Nevertheless, they kept right at the center of their religion a temple without images. The only real later anecdote about Hestia, that is, other than the anecdotes about her in the Homeric hymns, is also related by Ovid in the Fasti, and concerns the failure of Priapus, the phallic god, to assault Hestia in her sleep. This sets up the goddess Hestia something of an enigma and a riddle in Greek mythology. We know she was present in the perpetual fire, or Ignis Vestae in Latin, which constituted the political hearth of Rome, just as the Hestia Koine, or common Hestial hearth, had been the political center of Athens. Gu notes how the political symbolism of the common hearth is related to the creation of a democratic space in both Athens and Rome. Quoting Vernon, the public hearth constitutes the center, the common denominator of all the dwellings that constitute a polis. And unlike other temples, which are usually quadrangle, Vesta's sanctuary is round. In myth, her position is no less paradoxical. Simultaneously, she stays ever in Olympus and never leaves it, as we hear in Plato's Phaedrus. And at the same time, she's a completely imminent goddess, present on earth in every hearth, private or political. Ovid concurs with Hesiod in assigning primacy of place to Vesta in any prayer. In praying, we begin by addressing Vesta, who occupies the first place. Gu explains, Hestia was always invoked first, no matter which god or goddess was the main object of the ceremonial. The Homeric hymn to Hestia says that without her, it would be impossible to have feasts or festivals because they could be neither started nor brought to a close. A very interesting way of formulating this in Gu that I'll return to in a minute. He goes on, in Rome, if the Vestal sacred fires were to go out, the very existence of the city would be endangered. It is as if the sense of time, endurance, perpetuity, were assured by perpetuating the sacred feminine fire of Vesta. And so above all, Hestia signifies stability and permanence, and endows her celebrants and the community to which they belong with both a hearth and a home, in French, a fire and a place. Although Hestia shares the attribute of perpetual virginity with both Athena and Artemis, 
she alone is unrepresentable. She is distinguished from these other virginal goddesses by her unrepresentability. As Ovid prays to this goddess, gleaming in purple light, he underlines the impossibility even of seeing Hestia. Not indeed that I saw thee, O goddess. Far from me be the lies of the poet, nor was it meet that man, Vero, should look upon thee. Gu glosses, man, Latin, Vir, is not allowed to see this goddess, and it is impious to represent her, even by means of the poetic imagination. Ovid becomes aware of her numinous emanations, but never sees her. She is a presence, not a vision, and her temple is, like the image of the goddess herself, inviolable. Ovid reports the story of a hero who entered the burning temple of Vesta to save a statue of Athena which was being kept inside, noting this is a place in which man should not step foot, but here to save the statue of Athena, not Hestia since there is no statue of her, the hero will make an exception. The denial of access for men to Vesta's sanctuary is a guarantee of her virginity. Any form of penetration by a man into the sacred precincts of the purely virginal goddess can only be seen as coarse profanation. From this we can surmise that Hestia's sanctuary was very much a domain of women. Applying a little psychoanalysis of male desire to Hestia's unrepresentability, Ku notes that Vesta's virginity is at the same time a prohibition aimed at the male subject, against even sexual fantasies about the feminine principle which Vesta represents. Vesta must not be imagined and no man should penetrate her sanctuary. As we've seen, Ovid prohibits himself even an imagination of Hestia. For Gu, this inviolable virginity and strict unrepresentability are identical. Here, manly sexual desire or the priapic principle is forbidden, even the act of visualization, which could only be, in the case of Hestia, a phantasm and an impious fraud. In short, Hestia is femininity divested of images, or what Jung would call the anima. She evokes neither sensual desire nor any kind of fantasy. And we must ask with Cicero what is the reason for this and what is the function of this goddess in myth and religion. Cicero writes that the Latin word Vesta comes from the Greek, for she is the goddess that they call Hestia. Her power extends over altars and hearths, and therefore all prayers and all sacrifices end with this goddess, because she is the guardian, or kustos, of the innermost things, rerum intumarum. If we want to say that Hestia is the goddess of something, we might say with Cicero that she's the guardian goddess of the most intimate things. And this applies as much to the family as to the polis, as we hear in Aristotle's Politics, it is by the altar of Hestia that magistrates are invested with their authority. Now here's where the discussion of Hestia gets very interesting indeed, for we hear an etymology of her name proposed by the character Socrates in Plato's dialogue The Cratylus. This is Plato's famous dialogue on the philosophy of language. The discussion of language starts with the etymologies or etiologies of the various gods' names according to the Greeks. Socrates asks, shall we then begin with Hestia according to custom, nomos? And he goes on, take for instance, that which we call Uesia. This is the Greek word for being or the household. On the etymology of Uesia, Socrates goes on, some call it Essia, still others Osia. It is reasonable that the essence, Uesia, essence here meaning being and enduring, of all things be called Hestia. In fact, when we Greeks talk about being and we say that something is, t estin, or it is, we are evoking the name of Hestia already. The it is and all reality goes back to this vocabulary of Estia or Hestia in ancient times. And those who were called to the essence or Uesia of all things would naturally sacrifice to Hestia as first of all the gods. Here in Plato's account, the goddess Hestia is literally the goddess of being itself the reality of all things, and we name her every time we say that something is. Gu comments, this is how inquiry into Hestia's name begins. Her name is identical with to be. Hestia means estin, to be, or tiestin, it is. And this connection of Hestia to the Western vocabulary of being continues through all of subsequent Indo-European languages and their grammars. Think of the Latin French est, the German ist, or the Sanskrit esti. In fact, the name Hestia, in the much earlier Rig Veda, the function of the goddess Hestia is performed by the fire god Agni, whose name has the same roots, and much excellent work can be done constructing the Indo-European worldview by comparing the Greek Hestia with the Sanskrit Agni. 
The name of this goddess appears as well in the German Wesen, to dwell, and Wesen, essence, and retains part of its original meaning as to be, being, or to presence. Of course, Heidegger would pick up on this, arguing in the early 1940s that the Hestia myth is the myth of the is itself. In other words, Hestia is the goddess of philosophers, and her name is the very origin of the infinitive sein, to be. We don't need to go as far as Heidegger to point this out, already in Plato, Hestia is par excellence a goddess of the philosophers. That is a goddess of hearth and home, of autochthony and of exile, and of homecoming from out of the uncanny or foreign. We have a fragment of the early Pythagorean philosopher Philolaus of Croton. He writes, what essentially prevails as harmonious beginning, the unifying one in the middle of the spheros or great cosmic sphere of the world is the hearth. Here, Hestia is the origin, the beginning, and the center of the unifying one, the Spiros. And it has even been argued by some scholars that it is Hestia who the philosopher Parmenides goes to meet in his search for truth, i.e. Parmenides' unnamed goddess is not in fact the goddess of truth, Aletheia, as is usually supposed, but the goddess Hestia. And what she speaks about is truth. Aware of all these possibilities for interpreting Hestia, Heidegger asks in 1941, what is meant by this word concerning the hearth? He writes, the hearth is the site of a being homely. Heimish signs. Whenever homeliness occurs in being homely, Hestia is present. How is she present? Heidegger here points to the Greek word par estios, from para, or alongside, and Hestia, the hearth, and notes that Hestia is the hearth of the locale, the locale at which there stands the gods of the hearth. What is essential to the hearth is not only the fire which radiates and burns, but it is the being alongside the hearth, the par estios, wherein human beings are lighted, illuminated, warmed, nourished, purified, refined, or glow in the presence of the hearth. All the temples of the gods and all of human habitation have at their center this secure locale, hestia or the hearth, in the protection of which all becoming homely takes place. For Heidegger, in the Greek way of thinking, to dwell alongside the hearth, para estios, is to be blessed, with what properly occurs and is bestowed. On the other hand, to be exiled from the hearth is to be accursed, without a private hearth of the household or kitchen, but also to be stateless, without the public hearth or hestia koine, a political community. Athanasicus notes how the Orphic hymn to Hestia speaks of the hearth which dwells in the house's center. Originally, this was the Homeric Megaron, which had its hearth in the center and where Zeus Ephestios, or Zeus of the hearth, was evoked together with Hestia. This notion of Zeus as companion and protector of Hestia near the hearth we find already in Homer's Odyssey, as well as in Pindar's 11th Nemean Ode, which sings of Hestia alongside Zeus the highest and of Hera enthroned with him. Here, the connection of Hestia, the first of the Olympians, the last two Olympians, Zeus and Hera, is highly significant. What Pindar seems to be saying is that Zeus and Hera depend on Hestia above all, just as Hestia depends on them. And this is why I'm covering Hestia first in a lecture that will be mostly devoted to Zeus and Hera. For people who get interested in Hestia and want to maybe write their essays on her, I recommend two articles by Dechen and Vernon in Hestia Hermes, or the Religious Expression of Space and Movement in Ancient Greece, Vernon accounts for Hestia's ritual prerogative, or time in Greek, in terms of three categories, division of labor, marriage, and consanguinity. In other words, wherever labor is divided, in the household or the state, wherever marriages are legitimated or brought to an end, and wherever kinship bonds are established within families or tribes, there the goddess Hestia presides above all, these being her three realms of ritual prerogative. In misogynist Hestia, or the city and its autonomy, Marcel Dechen presents a somewhat feminist analysis of Hestia, pointing out how the festivals in which Zeus Polias, or Zeus of the Polis, is paired with Hestia Hetaria, articulate a fraternal body politic which is opposed to the private hearth of Hestia as the domain of women. In other words, men weren't satisfied with leaving the goddess Hestia and her sanctuaries to women, but often found a way in their own worship of the goddess to politicize Hestia and pair her with Zeus of politics. The more misogynist, the fraternal worship of Hestia became 
the more the rights of Koine Hestia, or the common Hestia of the state, overwhelmed and dictated to the Hestia worshipped in private hearths and the Hestia of women's temple cult. From this we can note how in Greek society there are almost always two Hestias. Hestia exists in the private hearth of an individual woman and her family, and her main ritual being the bridal transfer led by the mother of the bride to the hearth of the husband, and this is followed by the woman's maintenance of the hearth. But Hestia also prevails in the political community of men, especially in everything having to do with sovereign power, division of labor, arranged marriage, or kinship bonds to the tribe, city, or region. You can find these two articles respectively in Vernon's Myth and Thought Among the Greeks and De Chien's The Writing of Orpheus, both pretty easy to find online. The connection of Hestia to marriage is very interesting precisely because she's a virginal goddess. So why is she connected at all to marriage and sexuality? On this latter or political Hestia, Vernal makes a fascinating observation that Hestia is not only the middle of the private house and not only the middle of the tribe or the state, she becomes in the Greek way of thinking about the universe the middle of the world as such. The ovoid stone umbilicus or umphalos stone worshipped at Delphi was thought by the Greeks to be the center of the entire Hellenic world, a place where all the city-states interacted directly with the divine world of Olympus. The umphalos stone is sacred to Hestia and is thought of as a tomb and a reservoir of souls and of life. Even more interesting, Vernal points to Hestia cult in its association with Mukoi or Thalmoi, that is, caves, nooks, or tombs. The unrepresentable virgin goddess is at the same time a goddess of underworld hiding places, such as Denai's prison or Trophonius's cavern, more on those later. And so, paradoxically, Hestia has a central role in all hierogamies. She is present not only in the private hearth or kitchen fire, but she also protects the nuptial chambers, couch, or bridal bed on which the marriage is consummated. This makes a bit of sense. Hestia herself, a virginal goddess and protectress of the household and the state, oversees sexual and procreative activity with a view to their legitimacy. As Gu explains this, Hestia is unscathable perpetuity, or the ignis vesti, which can control both marriage law and civic law. For Heidegger, again drawing from the Orphic Philolaus, Hestia, or the hearth, is the middle of beings. And it's through Hestia that all beings are drawn forth into what they are. Most simply, being itself is the hearth. And it would be pretty amazing to read Heidegger's magnum opus, Being in Time, with Heidegger's myth of Hestia as being in mind. Although Hestia is being the middle and the center of everything, Hestia nevertheless suffers a degree of exclusion and marginalization. Perhaps most interesting of all, the goddess Hestia is neither the cosmos that she centers, nor the home that she protects, even though she is in herself the goddess of all inclusion and all exclusion. We might say that Hestia is the goddess of the very interiority or intimacy of being. And something like this seems to be on Plato's mind when he described the goddess Hestia in his famous dialogue the Phaedrus, describing the chorus of the gods leaving Olympus in order to go and celebrate their rule in the world. Plato writes, quote, Yet the great ruler in the heavens, Zeus, driving a winged chariot, proceeds first, arranging all things and thoughtfully caring for all things. But he is followed by an army of gods, fair yet fiendish spirits, arrayed in eleven squadrons. There are eleven only. Hestia alone remains steadfastly behind in the homestead of the gods. This scene in Plato is quite interesting. On the one hand, it legitimates the exclusion of Hestia from what will become the canonical Twelve Olympians. Hestia's place is Olympus, and there she remains always steadfast, taking care of the homestead of the gods while Zeus takes care of the world. In a way, this scene is all about capitulation, that is, to the head of Olympus, the captain, the capital king, Zeus. These eleven squadrons, or choruses of the gods, note how Hades as well is excluded, have a retinue in Plato, that is, beautiful human souls who follow in the various choruses. Dionysus is not mentioned, and this is of course because Plato in many ways wished to exclude him from the polis. Note how Plato is already a bit ambivalent about the eleven squadrons or choruses of the gods. He describes them as fair yet fiendish. That is, the main eleven Olympians can cause a lot of trouble. Hades and Dionysus are excluded. Hestia remains behind more or less to preserve the homestead of the gods that is to be wholly good. In Plato here, Hestia never involves herself in the salacious mythic intrigue which seemed to define the activity of the other Olympians. Hestia is connected to being itself. Or as Heidegger puts this, alone among the gods, 
Hestia is the one who remains and is most steadfast. She is the most reliable goddess of the Olympian pantheon, a constant presencing that keeps and protects the god's homestead, from which vantage point she as well appears in every mortal hearth, private or common. And this is why the Homeric hymn to Hestia, our earliest source, stipulates that without Hestia no festival can either begin or end. Gu's formulation of the sacrificial imperative to Hestia is ingenious. Without Hestia it is impossible to have feasts or festivals because they could neither be started nor brought to a close. Although Hestia's presence is needed to start a festival, the priest or the poet does not attempt to secure her arrival or propitiate her presence. She is already there, unlike the other gods. In bringing the festival to a close with Hestia, the Greeks may even be attempting to diffuse a worry, a serious danger. The danger is that the festival, in becoming unending, will uproot us into a no longer knowing of our place, a no longer differentiating the private household, the family or the tribe, from the common hearth and state. And so Hestia must be propitiated in her arrival, even though she's already present, and in her departure. That is, as one only now arriving, and thus granting a passage home. In all these counter-relations, the goddess Hestia becomes a giver of respite, as well as of expulsion. She might even be thought as a goddess of exile, and this because her very nature is stability and presence, of hearth and home, and especially of our belonging, or parestios, to the hearth. From where does Hestia get this attribute of stable or permanent presence? The myths are pretty clear that it's from her grandmother Gaia, and Hestia, as you'll recall, is the first child of Rhea, Flo. Earth, or Gaia, is the ever sure foundation of all, sings Hesiod, and Hestia alone among the Olympians is stable like Gaia. One might even say, as Ovid does, that Vesta is the same as the Earth, a homely presence that continues to exist, even in all absence or all exile. Hestia is not the stability of Earth itself, but the stability of Earth's very being. This is what makes her Olympian. For everything that withdraws or disappears for a time does so into Hestia as being. Heidegger perhaps most clearly expresses the basic function of the Olympian goddess Hestia in the Olympian pantheon when he writes, that Hestia is, after all, the hearth that gathers together and watches over the cosmos, and who discovers again and again that she is and is not the truth, Aletheia. The Olympian Hestia is the Hestia to Cosmu. This is the goddess who responsible for all appearing, presencing, and enlightening, who at the same time gives and declines measure, the goddess of the very measure of our sojourn here on earth. Given this noble function of the goddess in the Olympian cosmovision, it's pretty hilarious that we had to wait to the 21st century for artists to again attempt like Priapus to throw off the prohibition on sensual representation of Hestia, in a way sticking their tongue out at the ancient myth in a salacious joke. Hestia is unrepresentable, vestal virginity, but of course a Spanish artist would do this. Representing the all-encompassing Spheros, or sacred flames of Hestia, as well as her celestial nature, always in the center of the sky, Olympus, and then attempt to sell this sexy Hestia for three and a half thousand dollars. There is simply no limits to sacrilegious profanation in our era. Moving on from Hestia, our first stop should be the lineage of major Olympian deities as a whole. Here you see the six Olympians in the order of their conception and birth, as well as the most important Olympian children of Zeus, with Hera, Metis, Leto, Semele, Maia, and in some versions of the myth of Aphrodite's parentage, Dione. As mentioned already, having covered Hestia, we're just going to cover Hera and Zeus in this lecture, as well as the children of Zeus and Hera, these other Olympian children requiring a separate treatment. And this brings us back to Hesiod's Theogony, and its portrayal of the diverse character of Zeus. Hesiod kind of sped through the birth of the Olympians, helpfully giving us the order of their conception and birth, but not really getting into them individually. His interest at this point in the poem being more the rule of the Titans and the rise to power of the Olympians. As we've seen, Zeus is a passionate and amorous and quite rapey god. Above all, he's depicted as a husband, a father, and a lover, and his offspring are legion all of them being quite pleased to claim the authority of Zeus, as everyone who's ever studied any Greek myth knows, although he is the figurehead of a monogamous society, fidelity rules apply very differently to Zeus and to male gods and to men. Zeus's promiscuity causes much pain and suffering, and Hera is usually depicted, since at least Homer and likely much earlier, as a haranguing and vengeful shrew. We might justly question the morality of Zeus, 
And this makes it particularly interesting that in the Greek mind, he was in fact the model of virtue, of morality and justice, becoming eventually the one god of a henotheistic pantheon. As the textbook notes, Zeus is the wrathful god of justice and virtue. He upholds all that is sacred and holy and the moral order of the universe. The etymological root of his name from Sanskrit, Jus Pater, means bright, as does the Roman Eupater. Thunder, lightning, and sovereignty are his domain, and he's usually represented as a mature and bearded man in his prime. Zeus bears the aegis, or the goat skin, originally the cloak of a shepherd, as his magical shield. And the majestic eagle and mighty oak tree are sacred to Zeus. Importantly, although usually depicted as almost all-powerful or omnipotent, and often even as omniscient, any myths speak of the vulnerability of Zeus, placing a limit either on his omnipotence or his omniscience. Zeus's patriarchal rule of Olympus was by no means always absolute or supreme. And in myth, Zeus is sometimes subject to eight checks on his authority. One, the dictates of fate or Morai, his own daughters. Two, Zeus is often a slave of Aphrodite like any other god, as we hear in the Homeric hymn to Aphrodite. Three, Zeus never really supplants or subjugates the goddess Demeter of nature, grain, and the harvest. And in many ways, Demeter remains the greatest matriarch of antiquity, especially in her Eleusinian mysteries. And Demeter is not the only goddess to instigate a revolution against Zeus. In Homer's Iliad, we hear of an incident when Hera, Poseidon, and Athena all bound Zeus in chains. And it was only Thetis, the mother of Achilles, who Prometheus had prophesied would bear a child greater than Zeus, who eventually rescued him. To be sure, the most determined critic constantly challenging the authority of Zeus in Greek myth is his own sister and wife, Hera. And there are also threats to Zeus's rule coming from the Titan goddess Metis, Prometheus, and in some much more obscure myths we'll cover later, his sons Apollo and Dionysus. What holds the Olympian pantheon and world order of Zeus together is ultimately his marriage with Hera. And this is known as the hierogamy of Zeus and Hera, or Hieros Gamos, sacred wedding. The wedding with Hera ends up conferring on Zeus more power, legitimacy, and authority than anything else in his rule. This is very interesting and we should explore why this is so. The power of Hera is first sung in the Homeric hymn to Hera. I sing of the golden throned Hera, whom Rhea bore, immortal queen outstanding in beauty, sister and wife of loud thundering Zeus. She is the illustrious ruler, the one whom all the blessed ones throughout high Olympus hold in awe and honor, just as they do Zeus who delights in lightning and thunder. This relatively early reference to the power of Hera, already at least in part, defines her power in terms of the marriage to Zeus. And so it doesn't tell us very much about Hera worship before the rise of Zeus. This same limitation on our historical memory applies also to the elements of this hierogamy in the Iliad. There we hear that the son of Kronos clasped his wife Hera in his arms and under them, the divine earth sprouted forth new grass, dewy clover, crocuses, hyacinths, thick and soft to protect them from the ground beneath. And on this they lay together and drew around them a beautiful golden cloud from which the glistening drops fell away. The makeshift bed here being the fertility of the earth and the golden cloud a substitute for the veil. Before investigating the hierogamy of Zeus and Hera, we should ask about Hera's childhood. Who was she before the marriage to Zeus? Again, from Homer's Iliad, Hera is Rhea's favorite daughter who protects her while Zeus wars against Kronos. We also hear in Homer about the childhood of Zeus and Hera, unknown to their dear parents, they embraced in bed, and Zeus petted Hera for 300 years. For more details on the childhood of Hera, we have to look to the later travel writer Pausanias, who mentions that the lesser-known poet Olin speaks of Hera being raised by the seasons, the Horai, and her nurses being Uboia, Prosimna, and Acraia. For Pausanias, the location of Hera's childhood is Arcadia, and she has an interesting male tutor growing up, Temenos. The Titan goddess Tethys is sometimes her foster mother, and in the much later poet Nonus, we hear that Hera helped Zeus in his fight against the Titans, although it's unclear how. As well, the seduction of Hera by Zeus is variously told. In Pausanias, Zeus turns himself into a cuckoo bird in order to seduce Hera, and this explains the presence of the cuckoo on her scepter. Statius excoriates the incest motif found in Homer and speaks of Zeus's treacherous kisses to his sister. Although he was her brother, he gave no thought to the harm he was causing. Here, Hera, a sister, fears her brother's passion. In Callimachus, the couple had already eloped as teenagers and had their hierogamy then. 
this being the scene of their passionate coupling for 300 years. But in Nonus, these myths are civilized and given a much more moralistic spin. Aphrodite testifies to Harmonia that she joined Zeus and Hera only after Zeus had been pining for her for 300 years, known as thereby upholding the justice of Zeus. The hierogamy of Zeus and Hera is most canonically told in Hesiod. Lastly, he, Zeus, made Hera his blooming wife, and she was joined in love with the king of the gods and men, and brought forth Hebe and Ares and Eleuthuia. This, lastly in Hesiod, tends to paint Hera as a later wife of Zeus. One thing that's fairly consistent about the hierogamy myth is Gaia's gift to Hera at her wedding, which is the far western island of the Hesperides, which contained the golden apples and the tree, and an immortal serpent that guards them. Aristophanes in his play The Birds gives us precious testimony on how the hierogamy of Zeus and Hera was celebrated and imitated in Greek wedding ritual the marriage of Zeus and Hera being the model that all mortal weddings should aspire to. It is in Pausanias that we hear of Hera's wedding as a rite of transition, from the status of being a maiden or girl, pious, to being a mature woman, all grown up, Tilea. Although we only get this testimony in Servius, it's pretty clear that the wedding of Zeus and Hera is the original prototype, or the first real feast of all the gods. And there's a charming myth here about the one nymph, Chelone, who was too lazy to attend the ceremony, and so was turned into a tortoise. There's a neat short video on YouTube you can watch. In order to understand the importance of the marriage of Zeus and Hera in Greek religion and culture, we could do no better than to pick up Aphrodite of Agnew's book, Sacred Marriage and the Rituals of Greek Religion. The three most important sacred couplings discussed so far include those of Uranus and Gaia, Kronos and Rhea, and now Zeus and Hera, but it's interesting that only the wedding of Zeus and Hera ends up defining the institution of marriage as such. Avagniu was an extremely gifted lesbian Greek who completed this PhD under the supervision of Walter Burkert. So we know from these details alone that it's really the best book on the subject. She begins by noting that the concept of hierogamy has fascinated scholars and laymen alike since at least the 19th century. But also that this topic has been vastly misconceived in the scholarly literatures. What is most important to work out is how the hierogamy of Zeus and Hera defines the institution of marriage as practiced in every Greek marriage ritual. Mortal marriages are an imitation or mimesis of Zeus and Hera's Olympian hierogamy. We don't have time to get into all of Agnew's arguments, but something that might be fun and useful is how we might perform an ancient Greek marriage ritual. The two main rituals were the bridal procession and the bridal chamber rituals, with the wedding feast in the third place of importance and marriage rituals divided into three types, before, during, and after the wedding day. Usually taking place at the bride's home, the proolia consists of dedication to various gods who are called upon to oversee the joy and the well-being of the union. Another important prenuptial ritual is the bridal bath, undertaken in the hours before the wedding in a spring or sacred river. On the bridal procession itself, we have excellent testimony in Aristophanes and Philostratus the Younger, you see the women choruses as they marvel and shout for joy. This is a marriage, my boy, the first gathering of the wedding festival. During the procession, the bride was in a chariot, veiled fully or partly, and it was customary to throw quinces, roses, or violets at the couple, or to pelt them with flour or fruit. This sounds a lot more entertaining than throwing rice. The bridal procession itself is envisioned as accompanied by the Moirai, or the Three Fates, and it's overseen by the god of the wedding song, Hymenaeus, who sings his blessing song over the couple. In later literature, such as Shakespeare's Tempest, the goddess Hera or Juno oversees the wedding and the hymenal song is still performed. The bridal procession itself might go on for a very long time and pass through high mountain peaks. And in the cult of Argolid, sacred to Hera, we know that the procession crossed a sacred mountain stream with the interesting name Eleutherion Hudor, the freeing waters. The procession ritual seems to be an allegory of transition and a rite of passage from childhood or girlhood, pais, to maturity, telaya. Besides the bride, the most significant member of the procession is the bride's mother. It is the mother who carries the torches, who brings the hearth fire from one household to another, and in general protects the bride in her transition to a new household and a new identity. The role of fathers in ancient Greek marriage seems to be somewhat marginalized in the rituals themselves although they are invited to give their blessing to the union and to offer their family crests and traditions. Generally, fathers work out amongst themselves the important matters of dowry and inheritance. In all these rituals and others, Greek marriage is primarily 
a propitiatory imitation of the divine couple, Zeus and Hera, whose marriage is envisioned as being at the heart of the present world order of the cosmos. All right, so with that information, everyone out there is now prepared to do a proper ancient Greek wedding ritual for yourself, thereby outdoing everyone's favorite film. So the next question we can ask with Evagnio is how should we understand ancient Greek marriage? And what is the distinctiveness of the marriage of Zeus and Hera? To be sure, deities were coupled before them. Not only Kronos and Rhea, but also Gaia and Uranos were mutually entwined in fecund, procreative relations. What's interesting here is that marriage as such, marriage as an institution, begins with Zeus and Hera. And it is from this marriage of Zeus and Hera that all mortal marriage acquires both its legitimacy and its cosmic significance. In coming to participate in the wedding of Zeus and Hera, humans enter into the original essence of the Hieros Gamos. Consistent with Greek gender roles, Hera is portrayed as sober or modest, from which we get the important concept of Junonian sobriety, whereas Zeus is portrayed as passionate and wild. The hymenal song of the bridal procession commemorates Hera, the bride as Telia, the fulfilled, and Zeus as Telion, the fulfiller. And the marriage or gamos is considered as a telos, that is perfect fulfillment or end, through which Hera becomes the queen of the cosmos. Interestingly, a cultic calendar from the 5th century BCE records the sacrifices enacted for Zeus Heraios, that is Hera's Zeus. And much to our surprise, in some iconography, it is Zeus Heraios who wears the bridal veil, not Hera. Although Zeus and Hera are the preeminent deities of marriage as an Olympian institution, there are two other divine hierogamies or sacred weddings worth mentioning here. Avagniu here makes a helpful distinction between hierogamy proper and other types of couplings or unions. Hierogamy proper being defined as the union of two gods in the context of the marriage bond. For there are many couplings of gods and gods as well as gods and mortals that don't qualify as hierogamy in this sense. In fact, there are only three weddings which qualify as marriage bonds between two gods. The first is Zeus and Hera, the second is Hades and Persephone, and the third is, oddly enough, Dionysus and Ariadne in a divinized form. In the first hierogamy, Hera is herself the patroness of marriage, mature and skillful in nuptial rites. But in the second, Cora is abducted or raped by Hades and struck with terror at the depth of the earth, becoming by the end of the myth the venerated queen of the underworld. Avagniu considers that the marriage of Demeter and the mortal Iason may qualify here as a hierogamy, but notes that Iason is never divinized. Very strangely, the only other sacred wedding or hierogamy of two gods in Greek religion can be found in the wedding of Ariadne and Dionysus. And this notion can already be found in Hesiod. Golden-haired Dionysus took blonde Ariadne, daughter of Minos, to be his buxom bride, and then Zeus made her ageless and immortal. Ariadne is, in other words, a proper goddess. She is a mortal woman who becomes a god, much like Heracles or Pollux become gods. Most fascinating of all, the hierogamy of Dionysus and Ariadne was ritually reenacted every year in Athens in the context of a festival of Dionysus. And here, bizarrely, the king or archon's wife plays Ariadne and celebrates a ritual union with some interloper who plays Dionysus. This third hierogamy is, in other words, a myth of sacred cuckolding. As to the outcome, unlike Semele, who was incinerated for identifying with the great goddess Hera, Ariadne Basilana, or the Queen Archon's wife, is ritually divinized and coronated. Most of Avagnio's book is dedicated to exploring this bizarre ritual, as well as the structural symmetries and asymmetries in the wedding rites of these three couples, and this as well could make a great topic for an essay. So next up, having discussed the hierogamy of Zeus and Hera, let's look now to some of the more troubled undercurrents we can detect in myths of Hera in her vexed relationship with Zeus. For as the meme states, to this day, the most unrealistic thing that Disney ever did was portray Zeus as a loving family man. Correlatively, the most unrealistic thing ancient Greek mythology ever did was on occasion to portray Hera as a happy and loving wife. Thankfully, for the most part, the Greeks weren't so naive. And here we can ask who the real Hera was. As queen of the Olympians, Hera ever appears in Greek myth as regal, matronly, severe, stately, and often angry. Just as Zeus has Hermes as his herald, Hera seems to have the goddess of the rainbow, Iris. In art, Hera usually wears a crown and holds a scepter. Her most famous epithet is oxide, intended as a term of endearment. We can compare here the English doe-eyed, as well as white-armed. The peacock is particularly associated with Hera, as we've seen, 
and in its feathers are the eyes of Argus. Flocks of peacocks roaming the Greek countryside today are still associated with Hera. Regarding her function in myth, we hear in the textbook, she was worshipped less as an earth goddess than as a goddess of women, marriage, and childbirth, but these are functions she shares with other goddesses. And so we can ask what was her original function? Roberto Colasso here seems satisfied with a quite sexualized description of Hera as a goddess of the bed. She even wonders if old Okeanus and Tethys, who brought her up as a girl, are depriving themselves of enough time under the sheets. Here, Hera appears also as the goddess of the veil, or the pastos, the nuptial curtain that surrounds the bridal chamber, or thalamus. And Colasso notes how in Paestum in Samos, there is still evidence that the bed was a central devotional object of Hera cult. Again, when Zeus makes love to Hera in Homer, the earth sprouts a carpet of flowers for the occasion, clearly linking Hera to the theme of sexual fertility. This pseudo-bed is then surrounded by golden clouds, which here substitute for the veil or pastos. In Colasso's sexualized depiction of Hera, the bed was the primordial place par excellence, the playpen of erotic devotion. And most shockingly, he notes how in her majestic shrine, the Herion in Argos, there is testimony that the worship could see, placed on a votive table, the image of Hera's mouth clasped amorously around Zeus's erect phallus. Colasso comments, no other goddess, not even Aphrodite, had allowed an image like that in her shrine. Over and against the sexualized image of Hera, we can look to the pre-Hellenic Hera, and from there attempt to understand Hera's hostility to Zeus and myth. Although evidence for earlier Hera worship and archaeology at her well-known sanctuaries is slim, we know that from at least the 2nd century BCE, she was venerated on Crete, Samos, and Argos. In fact, her sanctuary on Samos was never exceeded in size by any temple in Greece. And we also know that at Olympus, the Herion predates the Temple of Zeus. Charlene Spretnak considers the connection or hierogamy of Zeus and Hera to be late and superficial, and notes how Hera's ability to give birth by parthenogenesis, that is without a male partner in many of her myths, reflects an earlier, more matrifocal religion and identity for this goddess. Even the famous Cambridge ritualist Jane Harrison, whose qualifications are not to be questioned, concludes that Hera was an indigenous goddess, that is, before the arrival of the Indo-European Greeks and that her myths, cult, and religion bespeak a more matrilinear system. Hera reigned alone at Argus and at Samos, and her temple at Olympia is distinct from and far earlier than Zeus. In Harrison's reading, Hera's first consort was a mortal man, Heracles. Then the conquering Indo-European northerners came down from Dodona to Thessaly, at which point Zeus dropped his real and earlier shadow wife, Dione, and arrived in Olympus as a conquering chieftain whereupon he marries Hera, the daughter of the land. While post-Dark Age Olympian myth depicts Hera as simply the jealous and quarrelsome wife, in fact, her earlier Bronze Age reality is as a turbulent native princess, coerced but never really subdued by an alien conqueror, Zeus. More or less all the myths of Hera, from Homer and Hesiod through to the end of the Greek world, are rife with telltale signs of her earlier powers and her suppression and disempowering with the arrival of and marriage to Zeus. First off here, have you ever wondered why the three children of Hera and Zeus are so lackluster and unimpressive compared to other Olympians? Mythically, this was a handy way to lessen Hera's importance and obscure the earlier memory of her as a great goddess. According to the tradition, Eileuthuia is the first child of Zeus and Hera, and she's the goddess of childbirth, but this function is also shared by Artemis. Their second child is Hebe, the goddess of the bloom of youth, who's primarily known as the cupbearer for the deities on Olympus. If you've ever wondered why the tarot deck has a house of cups, this goes back to the cult of Hebe. Eventually, when Heracles wins immortality, Hebe becomes his bride, and Hebe sometimes shares with Ganymede the role of the cupbearer, in fact, in some myths, she's replaced as the cupbearer by Ganymede when she's not doing her job correctly. Again, the misogyny in many of these Greek myths knows no bounds. The third and last child of Zeus and Hera is Ares, or the god of war, who is partnered in myth with Aphrodite, even though she's the wife of Hephaestus. The children of Ares and Aphrodite are fear, panic, and interestingly, harmonia, as we hear in the Theogony. Now, Ares seems to be the least important of the 12 of the 14 Olympians, and he's usually depicted as merely brutal in myth, in comparison to Zeus and Athena, who are also war gods, but moral and just. In fact, Zeus pretty much disowns Ares in the Iliad, 
where after being wounded by a mere mortal Diomedes, Ares goes to Zeus to complain, to which Zeus responds, Do not sit beside me and complain, you two-faced rogue. Of all the gods who dwell on Olympus, you are the most hateful to me, for strife and wars and battles are always dear to you. Zeus only puts up with Ares because he is a legitimate son, and likely does much of Zeus's dirty work for him. If he were not Ares' son, or if Zeus had any reason to suspect he was a bastard, he would have long been thrown out of Olympus. The interesting but somewhat politically suspect YouTube channel Ancient Greek Revisited has a great video on these scenes in the Ares myth, and urges us to think more carefully about Ares. It's a cool video, but I have to admit I'm still not really very interested in Ares. And nor, it seems, were the Greeks who admitted him into the Olympian pantheon, more in acknowledgement of the way the world actually was than the way they would have liked it to be. Let's turn now to the third H deity for this week, Hephaestus, the god of the forge. Some versions of his myth conveniently have him as a child of Zeus and Hera. Probably more to be believed is the genealogy where he's the child of Hera alone. The subjugation of Hera to Zeus seems visible in the fact that Hephaestus is lame from birth or crippled making this god as well an important link between disability studies and Greek myth. Despite having a disability, Hephaestus is like Prometheus, a wondrous god of creative fire, a smithy, inventor, and engineer. And in some of the testimony, he is the original world maker or demiurge, and is worshipped as the supreme god in the Samothracian mysteries. In traditional myth, his workshop is placed on Mount Olympus, where he creates things of extraordinary beauty and utility, often elaborately wrought. Sometimes in myth, his forge is under the earth, chthonic, and he is sooty and sweaty. One of his masterpieces, the Shield of Achilles, is described in exquisite detail in Homer's Iliad. And Hesiod sings another of his works, the Shield of Heracles. In Homer, Hephaestus crafts the original fembots, or golden female robots, and in Hesiod, Pandora, or the crown that she wears. Sometimes in myth, like in Homer's Iliad, he does Hera's bidding to unleash destructive fire, as in the Trojan War. And in classical Athens, he's often worshipped together with Athena, both as champions of progress and civilization. His link to Prometheus is already mentioned in the Homeric Hymn to Hephaestus, where they are both invoked together as archetypal divine culture heroes. One of the mottos I'd like to introduce now for the rest of this course is when in doubt about conflicting versions of the myth, we should trust the Homeric Hymn to Apollo, which seems to be a very early creation of the Greek mythological mind. In this hymn, Zeus is not Hephaestus' father, nor is he a product of Hera's infidelity. Hera gives birth to him alone to pay Zeus back for the birth of Athena from his head. Although Hesiod doesn't explain this myth in detail, we can read him as saying essentially the same thing, and so probably take the parthenogenetic birth of Hephaestus from Hera as an important given. As this traditional story goes, Hera is ashamed of his deformity and casts him from Olympus. And this is, in a way, Hephaestus' coming of age rite of passage. For humiliated and ashamed, he refuses to return to Olympus. And the gods are much vexed at this, being quite dependent on his inventiveness and engineering skill. And so they eventually send the god Dionysus to get Hephaestus drunk. The scene of Dionysus leading a tipsy Hephaestus back to Olympus on a donkey, becoming a proverbial subject for Greek vase painting. In the other version, Usually with Zeus as Hephaestus' father, it is Zeus who hurls him to earth, and here he falls on the volcanic island of Lemnos. Wherever there are volcanoes in the Greek mythological imagination, there either Hephaestus is working or the giants are fuming. The main myths for Hephaestus we find in the Iliad. In Book 1, he appears as an amateur marriage counselor for Zeus and Hera, then as a mama's boy, protecting Hera's dignity and honor, then as a serving boy at a consoling feast. In this first myth of Hephaestus in the Iliad, he bustles around the house, i.e. does women's work in trying to patch everything up between Zeus and Hera, and the Olympians laugh at this and do feel better. The forge god's saddest tale is sung by the ancient bard Demodocus in Book 8 of the Odyssey. Having been married off to the goddess Aphrodite by Zeus, as the story goes, to prevent all the gods from fighting over her, a marriage famously depicted in the shield of Achilles, Hephaestus here becomes the archetypal cuckold, with Aphrodite flaunting her frequent liaisons with the more manly Ares. Hephaestus captures them in his net and shows them to all the gods. And again they laugh, spurred on by the antics of Apollo and Hermes. The whole point again is to feel sorry for Hephaestus, since all the gods are laughing at him and treating him badly. 
despite his being a very important god to the smooth functioning of Olympus. More consolingly, in Hesiod, his mate is a grace, Aglia, the youngest of graces, and he's not in Hesiod generally subject to the same kind of ridicule as in Homer. The marriage of Hephaestus and Aphrodite is another hierogamy of a sort, but if Agniu doesn't include it in her typology of three sacred weddings, for the simple reason that this is a marriage not to be emulated. It's more profane and comical, nevertheless, the human truth behind it has proved endlessly attractive in the history of Western art. Depictions of Aphrodite visiting the workshop of Hephaestus can be pretty ambiguous. Is this a pathetic or a deeply meaningful pairing? Does Aphrodite love Hephaestus at all? Despite being unfaithful, Western painters seem to love exploring this scene. Similarly, when Western painters approach the infidelity of Ares and Aphrodite, the depiction as well can be quite ambiguous. Either stressing the sensuality and virility of this theme, or its monstrous and insensate blindness. From a bird's eye view, we can say that the myths of Hephaestus are as well ambiguous running the gamut from the pitiable and the salacious to the mystical and the profound. Hephaestus' archetype may seem a bit superficial in Homer, but there's a depth to it. And we'll be returning to this god when we cover Athena as well as the Samothracian mysteries in week 14. Since we're covering many of the Olympians in future weeks, we can skip them over here. By the end of this lecture, we'll be able to say five of the Olympians down and nine to go. It's also worth noting that I've skipped the textbook section on the Sanctuary of Zeus at Olympia. Still a great place to visit, don't miss the Herion. And the archaeology of Zeus's sanctuary there is very important because, like the Parthenon, it shows us the bigger picture of how all the Greek myths fit together. So to conclude this lecture, we need to do two more things. One, to look back to the rise of Zeus and the Gigantomachy, and also to the subsequent role of female goddesses in Zeus's creation of a stable, eternal world order. In other words, warning, more Olympianism ahead. So about Zeus, we've learned a lot already. His tale began as the extraordinary child of extraordinary parents. He was brought up in secret and led a charmed life or idyllic childhood. This is the motif of the divine child. We've also learned that upon reaching manhood, he had to overcome various challenges and adversaries, first his father Kronos, then the Titans, then the Giants, then Prometheus. Certainly an Indo-European god, he may have had a Cretan or Minoan precursor as a consort of the goddess. In the Gigantomachy, Zeus must kill a real and symbolic dragon or Typhon, and in the end he is the victor and wins a bride, or many brides, a kingdom and eternal power. This we could say is Zeus's hero's journey. Upon triumphing as the mightiest god of the pantheon, he begins to populate the world with additional divine children that help him run his Olympian administration. Remember how when Uranus was castrated, the drops of blood fell onto the earth and sea, producing the Furies, the Giants, and the Ash Tree Nymphs. The primal crime of the castration of the sky must be avenged, and this sets up the myth of the Gigantomachy. The Giants end up being led in their battle against the newly crowned Olympians by another god who is not a giant. This is Typhaeus, the dragon or serpent god. Typhaeus, the last child of Gaia, created either parthenogenetically in some myths or in Hesiod by laying with Tartarus, the odd thing here is that Gaia, through her daughter Rhea, supported Zeus's rise to power and deposition of Kronos. So why is Gaia's very next move to create the father of the monsters in order to support the giants against Zeus? Clearly for both the Titans and the Olympians, staying in Gaia's good graces is very difficult. And it seems that the Earth Goddess Mother hates nothing more than a tyrannical sovereign. Although the Titanomachy and the Gigantomachy are very distinct in Hesiod's Theogony, these two myths are very often confused in folk consciousness and also in the later sources. The Titanomachy is about the myth of succession and the emergence of a cosmos of order and justice. And the Gigantomachy seems to be about Zeus's ability to retain sovereignty over the Chthonic and the evil feminine. Between the two battles in lines 721 to 819, Hesiod sings chillingly about the imprisonment of the Titans in dank and murky Tartarus, and gives us the most complete archaic description of the Greek underworld. Importantly, there are no souls in it. We'll return to Hesiod's underworld in our unit on Hades. Like in the Titanomachy, the outcome of the Gigantomachy is a foregone conclusion. The giants and Typhaeus are defeated, the giants being imprisoned in volcanic regions, and Typhaeus and Tartarus along with the Titans. Who is Typhon and why did Gaia, or perhaps Hera, create him? Here's what Hesiod sings. 
When Zeus drove the Titans out of the sky, giant Gaia bore her youngest child, Typhoeus. Goaded by Aphrodite, she lay in love with Tartarus. This is the only time that Gaia will lay with Tartarus, the murkiest and dimmest region of being, almost non-being itself in the Greek way of thinking. And we might ask for the Greek mind whether she was driven to do this on account of her feminine nature and not on account of any particular hatred to Zeus. Again, in Greek misogyny, not only mortal, but also immortal goddesses are fickle. The arms of Typhius were made for deeds of might. His legs never wearied, and from his shoulders, there leapt up a hundred snake heads, such as fierce dragons have, and from them licking black tongues darted forth, and the eyes on all the monstrous heads flashed from under their brows and cast glances of burning fire, the evil eye. And from all the ghastly heads, voices were heard, weird voices of all kinds. These hundred snaky heads sometimes uttered words that the gods understood. And then again, they bellowed like bulls, proud, fierce, beyond restraint. Or they roared like brazen-hearted lions, wondrous to hear. Their voices sounded a whelp spark or a strident hiss and echoed through the lofty mountains. The depiction of Typhoeus's snake-like heads in Hesiod is almost oracular or prophetic, protean in its meaning, and transforms, like the old man of the sea, into many forms, weird voices of every kind. This is clearly a threat to the logical order, clarity, and sublime beauty represented by Zeus's Olympians. Hesiod goes on, an irreversible deed would have been done that day, and Typhoeus would have become lord over gods and men, had not the father of the gods and men kept sharp-eyed watch. He hurled a mighty bolt, and its ear-splitting crash reverberated grimly through the earth and the wide sky above through the sea, the streams of ocean, and through the underworld. From hurricanes and the fire that raged as thunderbolts struck the monster, the whole earth, sea, and sky seethed, and all the many gods then imprisoned or ruling over the underworld, Hades or Kronos, etc., shuddered at the unending din and frightful clash, and Zeus set fire to all of the hellish monster's gruesome heads, Typhius collapsed, crippled, on the groaning, giant earth. In the context of his battle with Typhius, Zeus in fact set the whole world on fire. Quote, A great part of the earth was burned by the immense conflagration and melted like tin, heated by the craft of artisans in open crucibles. In terrible rage, Zeus casts Typhius down into broad Tartarus. Typhius' presence in the world still exists, however, in the violent or damp winds that either shipwreck or blight crops. The textbook notes how in later versions, and in the sculptures discovered at Olympia, Heracles becomes an important ally of Zeus in his battle against Typhius and the giants. Note here how in Hesiod's account, anyway, the giants are hardly mentioned. There were other versions of the Titanomachy, however, in circulation, in which we hear more about the individual giants. Greek vase painting gives us this image of Zeus with his thunderbolt facing off against the dragon monster. Without doubt, the most incredible visual depiction of the Gigantomachy that Western art bequeaths to us is Giulio Romano's The Fall of the Giants, in itself an excellent reason to visit Mantua one day. The ceiling of this chapel is flat, but Romano manages to make it fully 3D, with the serene Olympians at the top and the giants being defeated in various scenes below. At the edges of the Olympian order of things, each and every god allied to Zeus is depicted, and the giganticism of man beneath the unolympian order of sin, hubris, or Satan is utterly vanquished. For modern scholarship, the Gigantomachy recalls the Babylonian myth of the defeat of Tiamat by Marduk, but as Athanasicus notes, the motif of the dragon or serpent slaying god is so widespread that we can't be sure about influence. Ditto the biblical serpent or the dragon being slayed by Saint George. All these myths seem related, but are so ubiquitous in the mythical consciousness of early humanity that it's difficult to establish a diffusion pattern. To its credit, the textbook notes that the myth of the Gigantomachy is one of the earliest myths, likely going all the way back to the conquest and amalgamation in about 2000 BC when Greek-speaking invaders brought with them their own gods with Zeus as their chieftain and triumphed over the existing people of the peninsula of Greece. If the textbook is right here, then it may be that the invading Indo-European Greeks brought the myth of the Titanomachy with them. They already had a myth of succession, after all. But in order to subjugate the native population of Greece and co-opt their indigenous religion, the Greeks added another myth to this, the Gigantomachy. Amazingly, the Homeric hymn to Apollo speaks of Hera as the mother of Typhoeus. Very upset with the invading Zeus, she prays, Hear me now, earth and broad sky above, 
and you Titans from whom gods and men are descended and who dwell beneath the earth round great Tartarus, whereupon she strikes the ground with the palm of her hand and Typhoeus is born. The Homeric hymn domesticates this myth somewhat when it says that Hera became pregnant with Typhoeus as a result of her rage at the birth of Athena. Like in the myth of her casting out Hephaestus on account of being lame, she hands over Typhoeus to be reared by the serpent Pitho on account of being a hideous monster. This is a tidy way in which the author of the Homeric hymn transplants the meaning of the story. If Hera is the mother of Typhon and responsible for the Gigantomachy, this may well reflect the battle of the indigenous peoples with the invading Zeus-worshipping Indo-Europeans. In any case, the Greeks win, and history is always told by the victors. As Athanasicus puts it, with the defeat of Typhon, Zeus rises supreme and his power is never to be challenged again. The last of Gaia's children, or the last of Hera's threats, the ultimate hope of a monstrous Jethonic world order, is banished forever into the gloom of Tartarus. And with the defeat of Typhoeus, Hera is rendered forever powerless, becoming by Homeric times the shrewish and vengeful wife archetype, rather than the earlier Gaian queen capable of birthing the father of monsters to resist Zeus's conquest. Probably no myth is more central to the male Greek sense of identity than the Gigantomachy. It is the very basis of the sense of civic pride in archaic and classical Greece a triumph of civilization over disorder in the feminine, and of a particular Greek city over barbarian disorder. On the Parthenon and Athens, the Gigantomachy was portrayed on the east side of the outer frieze, the side of dawning light. The great altar of Pergamon also commemorates the Gigantomachy in a colossal marble frieze, 100 meters long and 2.5 meters high, in which, like in Romano's fresco, each Olympian god is shown vanquishing a giant. And lastly, the Gigantomachy is also central to the myth that Greek civilization told itself about its greatest gift to the entire subsequent history of humanity, the gift of philosophy. Plato in The Sophist at line 246a speaks of the conflict between earlier Ionian natural philosophers or materialists and later post-Pythagorean idealist philosophers leading to Plato himself, noting that there seems to be a kind of war of the giants and the gods going on amongst the philosophers the Ionians and the Eleatics, the Materialists and the Idealists, waging an endless battle with one another about the very meaning of being. It's no exaggeration to say that in myth and society, as in philosophy and science, the Gigantomachy is continually held up in Greek thought as what is distinctively Hellenic, the order of Zeus, and what must win out against barbarian savagery and the principles of the feminine. For example, in the Greeks' triumph over the Amazons, often associated with the Gigantomachy and also depicted on the Parthenon and at Pergamon. The Gigantomachy is so foundational to Greek mythical consciousness that even the triumph of a particular brand of philosophy, Plato's idealism, wants to be associated with it, as we've seen. Last up this week, and falling just after the Gigantomachy in Hesiod's Theogony, are the myths of Zeus's marriage to many goddesses to shore up his rule. And this is some of the most interesting material of all in Greek mythology, so perk up your ears. Well before his eventual hierogamy with Hera, Zeus had many wives. At line 886, Zeus, king of the gods, took as his first wife, Mates, a mate wiser than all gods and all mortal men, for Zeus's omniscience over and against Prometheus another child of the Titans associated with wisdom. But when she was about to bear grey-eyed Athena, then through the schemes of Gaia and starry Uranos, he deceived the mind of Metis with guile and coaxing words, and lodged her in his belly. In the aftermath of the Gigantomachy, it seems that Zeus is again in the good graces of Gaia and Uranos. For it was fated that Metis would bear keen-minded children, First, a grey-eyed daughter, Tritogenia, an epithet of Athena, who in strength and wisdom would be her father's match, and then a male child, high-mettled and destined to rule over gods and men. But Zeus lodged her in his belly before she did all this, that she might advise him in matters good and bad. Just as Kronos had swallowed all the Olympians except Zeus, Zeus's first sovereign act after defeating Typhoeus is to bed Mates, whose name means resourcefulness, wisdom, or cunning. Athena will end up being raised in Zeus's mind and born fully mature from his skull. But the second male child, prophesied by Gaia and Uranos, will never be conceived. This first coupling of Zeus and an immortal goddess reveals Zeus as fallible and quite a lot like his father Kronos, swallowing not children this time, but a pregnant wife. 
Here, Zeus is only saved and the outcome becomes beneficial on account of the renewed support of Gaia and Uranus. And this sets up in Hesiod's account a sequence of wives, all of whom seem to be far safer mates, and whose children with Zeus serve important tactical and strategic roles, after which he'll go on to sire Hermes and Dionysus, and much later, as we learn in other myths, a series of important demigod children with mortal women. What you see here is a very short list. The full A to Z of Zeus's mates and children based on fragmentary testimony is so extensive that telling all its myths would take up the rest of this course. The next two couplings of Zeus and a goddess are often neglected, but perhaps the most important things that Zeus ever did. At line 901, Hesiod sings, Zeus's second wife was radiant Themis. She bore the seasons, or horai, lawfulness, eunomia, and justice, decay, and blooming peace, irony, who watch over the works of mortal men, and also the fates, or moirai, to whom wise Zeus allotted high honors. So alongside Athena, we now have from Themis six more immortal goddesses to contend with. Themis, as we've seen already in the Prometheus myth, is a centrally important Greek goddess. Her name comes from Tithemi, which means to set down or establish, and tends to mean custom, law, or even song. She was doubtless an earth goddess, and as we've seen, became syncretized with Gaia and Aeschylus. In Greek religion, she's often depicted as a mantic prophetess, and here she provides the structure and boons of the new world order of Zeus, which is characterized by temporal regularity, the seasons, as well as the limits of fate or firm law. The Cambridge ritualist Jane Harrison, in fact, dedicates her masterpiece on the social origins of Greek religion to the goddess Themis. According to Karl Kareni, the seasons or horai get their name from ora, which means the correct moment. More than any other goddesses or children of Zeus, they seem to most reflect the character of his rule, a rule defined by good order, justice, and peace. Traditionally, the Horai guard the gates of Olympus, promote the fertility of the earth, and also rally the stars and the constellations into the motion of their dance. Recall how in Hesiod's works and days, together with the graces and persuasion, they crowned Pandora. And we also heard earlier that Aphrodite was greeted by them at her birth which doesn't seem too consistent since they hadn't been born themselves yet, but that's Greek myth for you. The 43rd Orphic Hymn to the Seasons is particularly beautiful and can help us to connect to these goddesses. Hail, Horai, daughters of Themis and Lord Zeus, you know me, Dike and thrice blessed Irene, pure spirits of spring and the blossoming meadow. You are found in every color and in all sense wafted by the breezes, ever blooming, revolving and sweet-faced, O Horia, you cloak yourselves with the dew of luxuriant flowers. You are holy Persephone's companions at play, when the fates and the graces in circling dances come forth to light, pleasing to Zeus and the fruit-giving mother. Come to the new initiates and in their reverent and holy rites, and bring seasons perfect for the growth of goodly fruit. Some scholars think that prior to the rule of Zeus, the Horai were originally Thalo, Oxo, and Carpo, that is spring, summer, and autumn the Greek Mediterranean climate only knowing three seasons. Thalo, the one who brings blossoms, becomes the Roman flora. Oxo's name means the increaser. Carpo means withering. It's also associated with ripening or harvesting. Sometimes these goddesses are depicted beautifully in Western art. Here you see Thalo, or spring, Oxo, or the increase of summer, and Carpo, or the harvesting of fruit in the fall. Naturally, modern depictions of the graces or seasons tend to add a fourth. Winter, as in this Art Nouveau depiction by Alphonse Mucha. Equally, if not more important to this first set of three children are the goddesses who bring a limit, and these are the three fates. Moirai in Greek and Parkai in Latin. Clotho's name means the spinner, Lachesis the apportioner, and Atropos the cutter of the thread of life. We'll be covering them more in detail when we get to Plato's myth of air. Also, the Greeks speak of fate in the singular, Moira, in which form she's often related, especially in later sources, to luck or fortune, tuke, and to necessity, anake. Probably the most important thing about the fates is that even Zeus himself must bow to the inexorability of their decrees. Helping us account for the special relationship of Zeus and Themis, that can make sense of these six centrally important goddesses which they bear, we read in the Homeric hymn to the supreme son of Kronos, about Zeus I will sing, the best and the greatest of the gods, far-seeing ruler and accomplisher, who confides his words of wisdom to Themis as she sits and leans close. 
This image of Themis as the most intimate companion and confidant of Zeus is even suggestive of some esoteric conversations that take place between them. One thing is clear, whenever the seasons or the fates bestow or withhold blessing, we are to think of the will and the mind of Zeus, as well as the haloed customs and children of Themis. And so the Orphic hymn to the fates sings, Fate and Zeus's mind know all things for all time. It is interesting that although the Greeks considered the fates to be inexorable and necessity to rule the cosmos rather than free will, they can still pray so beautifully to the fates of anxious hope, primeval law, and the measureless principle of order. In life, the fates alone watch all of this, and nothing escapes their gaze. It is only, quote, fate and Zeus that knows all things for all time. Although Hesiod isn't clear about the ages of the fate, sometimes in Western art they are depicted within the mother maiden crone archetype, or as two maidens, the spinner and the threader, overseen by a dark goddess, death. The three fates might be encountered anywhere. For example, in an assembly of three women in the village square, as we see here on the left, in a painting by Odillon Redon, and they are especially associated with the mysteries of the Chthonic and the Night in William Blake's painting, Hecate. After these first seven children from Metis and Themis, Athena, the Seasons and the Fates, Zeus next marries Euronome, Oceanus' and Tethys' fair daughter, who bears to him the three graces, or Carites, all fair-cheeked Aglaia, Euphrosune, and shapely Thalia. Their alluring eyes glance from under their brows, and from their eyelids drips desire that unstrings the limbs, thus associating them with Aphrodite, Eros, and Persuasion. It's interesting that Zeus couples with the Oceanid Euronome, whose name means etymologically wide distribution, Euronome, but not with the Oceanid Thetis. In some versions of the myth, Thetis herself rejects Zeus's advances for fear of and respect to Hera. And in others, she's aware of the prophecy that she might bear to Zeus a son more powerful than he. There is nothing threatening about Zeus's second choice for an Oceanid bride. And their children, the Graces, are all light and all good. Aglaia's name can mean splendor, shining, or brightness. Euphrosune means gaiety, joy, or mirth. And Thalia, blooming, good mood, or happiness. In Roman myth, the three Carites become the Gracii, patronesses of amusement and festivity. And the Latin translations of their names are suitably charming. Aglia becomes claritas, or the brightness in which everything clear comes into being. Euphrosune becomes serenitas, or serenity, the grandeur in whose strength everything bright stands. And Thalia becomes hilaritas, or hilarity, as the merriment in whose play everything liberated sways. The very short Orphic hymn to the Graces sings, Hear me, O illustrious and renowned Graces, daughters of Zeus and full-bosomed Eunomia, Aglaia, Thalia, and blessed Euphrosune, here including the mother of the Graces among them and changing her name somewhat. Lovely wise and pure mothers of joy, many shaped, ever blooming, beloved of mortals, we pray that each in her turn, spellbinding and with petal soft face, come ever accessible to the initiates to confer prosperity, thus suggesting the Graces' role alongside the seasons as fertility goddesses. The depiction of the Graces in Western sculpture and art is equally, if not more, stunning than that of the seasons. These are, quite simply, the most charming goddesses of Greek myth. And it is, of course, far preferable to encounter this trinity of goddesses, born of Euronome, than the more darksome trio, children of Themis, the Fates. The brighter children of Themis and Zeus, the seasons, and the graces are also often confused. One key attribute all six goddesses have is being leaders of the festive dance. The sequence of Zeus's fourth to eighth wife begins with Demeter. After Zeus slept with Demeter, who nurtures many, she bore him white-armed Persephone, whom Idoneus or Hades snatched away from her mother with the consent of wise Zeus. Then he fell in love with Nemosune, the lovely-haired, who gave birth to the gold-filleted muses, lovers, all nine, of feasts and enchanting song. Leto, that is the child of Phoebe and Koyos, lay in love with Aegis-bearing Zeus and gave birth to Apollon, an arrow-shooting Artemis, children comelier than all the other sky-dwellers. 
And only then, last of all, Zeus made Hera his buxom bride. And she lay in love with the king of the gods and men and bore Hebe and Ares and Eleutheria. No sooner than he finally marries Hera and has these children, does he himself bear grey-eyed Athena. Just think of this setup. Zeus, in the celebration of his triumph over Typhius, is now so fecundated out that he gives birth to Athena from his head sometime after marrying Hera. What would any self-respecting wife out there think if you married a guy who had gotten around so much that he himself had become pregnant in the process? This whole sequence in Hesiod's Theogony is fascinating and of course it starts with the most threatening of all Zeus's nine brides, Metis. Having averted this first threat of a successor, he proceeds to sire a veritable pantheon of utterly amazing goddess daughters, always with safer lovers. Certainly overkill, but not without its deep psychological and political reasons. Athena, the fates, the seasons, the graces, the muses, even these are not enough to shore up Zeus's perpetual rule. He also needs to sire a fertility goddess, Persephone, and his most loyal and excellent children, Apollo and Artemis. Zeus rarely pursues Demeter after this, and Leto almost disappears from myth, except for a few telling interactions with mortals like the Niobe tale. Were Demeter and Leto a little bit too much like Gaia and Rhea for Zeus's taste? After all this baby-making, it's time at last to marry Hera, who is Rhea's last and favorite daughter, and sire three far less significant deities, all the major functions and roles already being taken. At this point, Zeus has successfully colonized and redistributed most all of the powers of the feminine. From this point forward, wisdom, fate, time, grace, death, youth, skill, inspiration and war, and all visions of the feminine will all derive at least indirectly from the power of Zeus. And so the Theogony ends with yet more hierogamies, for after Hera gives birth to Hephaestus in retaliation, Zeus goes on to father Hermes by Maia and Dionysus by Semele, a mortal woman, as well as Heracles by Alcmene. And Zeus is far from the only god getting it on in Hesiod's Theogony at this point. Poseidon marries Amphitrite, their child is Triton, Dionysus marries Ariadne, who becomes Devonized, Heracles marries Hebe, and Perseus and Oceanid marries Helios, their children being Circe and King Aetes. Aetes marries Idaia, their child being Medea. In short, there's a lot of weddings after the Gigantomachy. Most importantly, Radiant Demeter, a goddess, and Iason, a hero, coupled with passion on a field plowed three times in the rich soil of Crete, and their child was noble Plutus, whose name means wealth and who should not be confused with Hades as the Romans did when they called Hades Pluto. As Hesiod's Theogony winds to a close, Harmonia, the child of Ares and Aphrodite, bears to Cadmus, the second lineage of divine women in Greek mythology, Eno, Semele, Agawe, and Autonoe, more on them later, and the list of weddings and couplings continues, mostly between gods and mortals, and eventually leading Hesiod to the story of Jason and Medea, to Chiron, to the daughters of Nereus, the Nereids, and to the tale of Thetis and Peleus, who bore Achilles. Scholars have noted that while this ending is rich in important details for Greek myth, it's also anticlimactic and rambling, and most believe that the poem was truncated, and that the last hundred lines or so was based on later interpolations of all the immortal goddesses that Zeus bore. It's important to underline that his children with Themis and with Nemosune are the most momentous for the Olympian pantheon and Olympian religion. Perhaps Zeus's most politically effective move, other than giving birth to Athena from his head, was to sire 18 immaculate goddesses with Themis, Uranome, and Nemosune. For it is these 18 goddesses more than any others who define the awesome character of Zeus's rule. The nine goddesses from Themis and Uranome define the temporality of fate, order, justice, and peace, as well as the three faces of gaiety or celebratory grace. But it is the muses who become the Olympian Zeus-sanctioned patronesses of all the arts. Calliope, whose name might mean beauty, oversees the epic. Cleo, or fame, the muse of history. Euterpe, or joy, the muse of music. Melpomene, or the passionately melodic, oversees tragedy. Terpsichore is the muse of dancing and the dance. Erato, the muse of love and the lyric. And Polyhymnia of the many songs, that is the muse of the hymnal. Urania, as celestial muse, comes to be associated with astronomy, at least when it's invented. And Thalia, a muse of festivity, comes to oversee comedy. 
Again, the Orphic hymns are wondrous in their ability to connect us to the goddess Nemosune and her nine muses. I call upon Queen Nemosune, Zeus's consort, who gave birth to the holy, sacred, and clear-voiced muses. Evil oblivion that harms the mind is alien to her, for it is she who gives coherence to the mind and the souls of mortals. She increases men's ability and power to think. And sweet and vigilant, she reminds us of all the thoughts that we always store up in our breasts, never straying and ever rousing the mind to action. The function of the Mosune here is to stir the memory of sacred rites and ward off oblivion or lethe. In the Orphic Hymn to the Muses, the Pyrian rather than the Heliconian tradition of the Muses is underlined. By this time in the 1st to 2nd century CE, the Muses have become the birthers of unblemished virtue in every discipline, nourishing the soul and setting thoughts aright, sacred leaders and mistresses of the mind's power. The Orphics thus also add another muse, the mighty goddess Agne from Hagne or sacred place naturally as the goddesses who preside over all the arts and disciplines, the muses will come to be variously understood, and many myths will be associated with them, although every inventory of their powers and mythic associations will likely fail to capture their original essence as sung by Hesiod or by the Orphic Hymn. The ultimate identity of each of these muses, although it becomes canonized, remains mysterious. These are actual goddesses, after all, who show up either singly or as a group every time divine inspiration is granted in mortal life. We can thus conclude this lecture with a brief glance to Marcel Dechen's article, The Memory of the Poet, also assigned this week. Dechen notes that long before Hesiod's nine muses, each of whom is insufficiently defined in the 7th century BCE, there were in fact only three muses sometimes thought as the muses who presided during the reign of the Titans. Their names are Melite, Memne, and Iode, and we know they were revered in an ancient sanctuary precisely on Mount Helicon. Melite, or the Greek word for care or practice, designated the discipline indispensable to any bardic apprentice, which was attention, concentration, and mental exercise. Memne names the psychological function of memory, which enables recitation and improvisation. An iode or song is the product, the epic recitation, the completed poem, and the end result of both melite and memne. The Chen thus asks, what is the meaning of the muse and the function of memory? And answers that for the poet, remembrance came through a personal vision, or we might add divine visitation, that ensured direct access to the events his memory evoked. The poet's privilege was to enter into contact with the other world, and his memory granted him the power to decipher the invisible. In Hesiod's case, his cult of the Muses, replacing even the cult of Hestia with which this lecture began, the royal figure or sovereign is simply represented by Zeus. The poet's function here in Hesiod is still to serve sovereignty, that is, by reciting the myth of the cosmos and the sovereign's emergence to power. And thereby the poet collaborates through the Muses directly in setting the world in order. Indeed, like the prophet or diviner, Hesiod claims the ability to reveal the thoughts of Aegis-bearing Zeus. Recall how although they can tell many a lie, the Muses' distinctive gift is the truth. The only slightly later 6th century BCE poet Pindar speaks of this power of Aletheia or truth as Zeus's daughter, and says that he always evokes her together with the Muses when he is remembering. A somewhat later, almost classical poet, Bacchylides, speaks of Aletheia as a fellow citizen of the gods, the only one allowed to share in the life of all the immortals. In Hesiod, as in the poetic tradition to follow, Aletheia can conquer everything, even blame Momos. And Bacchylides goes on, to be sure the blame of mortals attaches to all works, but Aletheia always triumphs. This being the first statement of the idea that the truth will win out in the end. The poet, from Hesiod to Bacchylides and beyond, identifies themselves as one who has the power to see Aletheia, whether in true myth, in heroic narrative, or as in Hesiod's works and days, in the rituals of the home and the farm. The poet is, in short, in Dechen's characterization in the title of his book, The Master of Truth. But Dechen also notes a transformation in how the poet and his special relationship to truth is configured between the archaic and the classical period. 
By classical times, the system of thought that privileged sung speech as a religious power had become no more than an anachronism. Its persistence simply reflected the tenacity of a particular elite. No longer beholden only to the sovereign chieftain god and to the king that resembled him, as in Hesiod's poem, the poet's job increasingly became that of exalting the nobility and praising the rich landowners, their patrons, who were developing a luxury economy, spending large sums and glorying in their matrimonial alliances, priding themselves on their horse-drawn chariots and athletic prowess. In these later traditions, Zeus remains central, but the poets, in accordance with their patrons' vanity, increasingly come to privilege the children of Zeus, such as Apollo, in drawing comparisons between their patrons and the immortal gods. Dechen concludes this article, but whether as an official of the sovereign or as one who praised the warrior nobility, the poet was always a master of truth. His truth was a performative truth, never challenged or demonstrated, and thus fundamentally different from our own concept of truth. Early aletheia meant neither agreement between a proposition and its object, nor agreement between judgments. It was not the opposite of lies or falsehood. The only meaningful opposition involved aletheia and lethe, truth and oblivion. And if the poet was truly inspired, if what he had to say was based on a gift of second sight, then his speech would be identified with the truth. What the memory of the poet ultimately bestowed was praise, laudatory speech, light, memory and truth. All of these powers being opposed to blame, silence, darkness, oblivion, and lethe. In this lecture, I've covered the basic outlines of the Olympian pantheon, especially Hera, Hestia, Hephaestus, the Gigantomachy or Zeus's ultimate triumph, as well as the many marriages which follow, all serving to stabilize the eternity of Zeus's reign. From De Chen, we can derive the observation that all these stories come from the poet's vision of the world as well as from the function of the poet in archaic societies, either to praise the sovereign king and be a repository of sacred truth, or to exalt and secure everlasting fame for his patrons in one way or another modeled on the Olympians. But regarding these Olympians themselves as Colasso notes in chapter four, the first thing we can say is that they were new gods. They had names and shapes, but the historian Herodotus assures us that before yesterday, nobody knew where any of these gods had come from, nor whether they had existed eternally, nor what they looked like. When Herodotus says yesterday, he means Homer and Hesiod, who he calculated as having lived four centuries before himself. To his mind, it was Homer and Hesiod who gave the gods their names, shared out the arts and honors among them, and revealed what they looked like. Here, the influence of Hesiod's vision of the cosmos and the gods, his philosophical systematization, his shaping of Greek religion into its definitive form, as it were, would become absolutely decisive, as Colasso notes brilliantly. When we read Hesiod, we see the enormous effort involved in establishing a singular and systematic cosmogony, as well as a slow detachment of the gods from what is either too abstract or too concrete. In other words, Hesiod isn't making his gods into merely abstract divine powers and thus ignoring the folk tales surrounding them but nor is he overtly privileging the specific folk differences in how each of the gods are worshipped or understood. In Homer, and especially in Hesiod, what we witness, in other words, is the creation of the properly pan-Hellenic mythology. And only at the end, that is after the cosmos had quaked again and again in the Titanomachy and the Gigantomachy, did Zeus at last divide up the honors among all the gods. In this very process, as we've seen, generating an entire pantheon of new deities whose very existence in the world would settle the matter of the eternity of Zeus's reign once and for all. And henceforth, for this new Olympian pantheon, the earth was there simply for raids, whims, intrigues, or experiments. The pantheon had become not only transcendent, but also perfect. And here Colasso notes, but there is something assumed in Homer, but never mentioned by him something that lies behind both his silences and his eloquence. It is the idea of perfection. What is perfect in its own origin does not wish to dwell on how it came into being. The Olympian pantheon and the myths surround them, in other words, deliberately forget the slow and gradual process of coming to be as we've tried to explore in this lecture. And this is because what is perfect severs all ties with its surroundings. It is sufficient unto itself. And yet more brilliantly, Colasso writes, in the long history of divinities, 
the inhabitants of Olympus were the first who wished to be perfect rather than powerful. Like an obsidian blade, the aesthetic for the first time cut away all ties, connections and devotions. What remained was a group of figures isolated in the air, complete, initiated, perfect. Three words that Greek covers in just one, Telaios. The scene of Zeus's rise to power and establishment of the Olympian pantheon is in other words the scene of the birth of an aesthetic religion. The whole thing is motivated by the idea of completion, initiation, perfection, all of which comes to be associated in Telos, Telaios, with two things, on the one hand mystery initiations and on the other the marriage of Zeus and Hera, as the ultimate or final hierogamy, the mystery of a perfected life. And it is to these origins that Colasso traces the emergence of Greek sculpture, as its most distinctive art form and mode of representation of its gods. In the transition from archaic to classical mythology and religion, the centrality and importance of Zeus will of course persist, but at the same time and almost by a kind of magic, the limelight of Greek religion will shift to another deity, Zeus's favorite son Apollo. As Colasso puts this, it is in view of Apollo that Zeus's womanizing takes on a new light. To be sure, each affair always conceals a supreme danger. And every time Zeus approached a woman, he knew he might be about to provoke his own downfall. Thus far the stories take us, but for every myth told, there is another unnameable that is not told, another which beckons from the shadows, surfacing only through illusions, fragments and coincidences, with no one ever daring to tell it in a single tale. And here, the son stronger than his father is not to be born yet, perhaps because he is already present. He is Apollo. Over the never-ending Olympian banquet, a father and a son are watching each other, while between them, invisible to all but themselves, sparkles the serrated sickle Kronos used to slice off the testicles of his father, Uranos. And this explains the pains to which the Greeks went to always portray Apollo as the most loyal of all possible sons to Zeus, while at the same time allowing Apollo or Dionysus for that matter to take over almost all the most important functions of their religion. As mentioned, the nine muses as well as the daughters of Themis are perhaps the most important of all Zeus's children, for they are the very bearers of Olympian order, justice and peace of the limits of fate to which Zeus himself is beholden, and of the diverse arts and disciplines of memory that make all these things real. And so it is significant that one of Apollo's most powerful epithets is as Apollo Musagetos. And from this vantage point, as leader of the chorus of the Muses, there can be no question that Apollo's influence was destined to surpass even that of Zeus. Although, as it seems, always with Zeus's blessing. More on these developments and the transition from archaic to classical mythology in the coming weeks. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you then.